Hey, hello, hi, all. Welcome to and or back to the Echo Theory podcast. I am your host, Jill Treese, and this week's episode is a really cool one because we have on an amazing guest, Jim Masterson of The Masterson Method. And I think this episode is going to be a great one for you guys to listen to because it's a little bit of a break from the training and behavior, just question and answering thing that we've got going on. And I will let you guys know that 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 there are some changes coming soon in regards to that. So be on the lookout for that. I'll probably talk about that more in next week's episode. But um, in this week's episode, you know, we're just going to be talking to Jim, getting getting real with Jim (laughs) and talking about his backstory, how he got into body work and how it can help horses that might be dealing with some pain and discomfort because likely aren't they all i mean they have a human like you know 10 to 15 percent of their body weight on their back of course they're going to be dealing with some pain so i think i think this method is a really cool one to incorporate for positive reinforcement and clicker trainers because it the the point is to stay below the horse's threshold so that they barely are even noticing that you're there that's the goal so it's like kind of the best form of negative reinforcement that there is, (laughs) if that makes sense. Hopefully it will make sense the more that we get into it and um, you guys can just tune in and see what Jim has to say. So without further ado, let's get into it with Jim Masterson. Alrighty, you guys know the drill. This is where the ads go. Unfortunately, there will not be a Patreon one today. I know that you guys are super sad about that. Um, but it's because I'm going to have to redo it for the third time. <laughs> um, that's unfortunate, but I am restructuring the Patreon to accommodate some things, switch some things around, raise the quality on some things, and desaturate the podcast a little bit. So um, I'm just going to leave the ad off today but if you would like to become a patreon please feel free to check out patreon.com slash echo theory where you can support the podcast and have all sorts of access to training and behavior consultation type services um it will be undergoing a bit of a restructuring on july 1st all of my patrons of course know this because i have posted it on patreon um and if you did not please look at your patreon it's happening um and everything will restructure on the first of the coming july month Um, so yeah, uh, if you're listening to this episode and you've been like, what the heck happened to all of the other episodes where that ad was there and it talked about all the services and broke everything down. Yep. It's all changing, but I'm going to go over that in a different episode. So don't worry about it here and disregard every single Patreon ad hitherto. Is that how you use that correctly? I don't know, but Anyway, uh, yep, let's do the ads, and then uh, I actually don't know if there will be ads or not. I think I might have to apply for them. Um, I, it, it might happen today. It might happen later. I don't know. There's a cat on my desk. Oh, my God, I have to talk to Jim Masterson while you cannot be screaming on my podcast. Please, please do not do it. He said, but I have things I have to say. <laughs> okay, anyway, we're going to get into it, guys. Are you ready? I'm so nervous. Oh, my God. Okay, you know what? You're a professional. You got this. You got this. It's fine. He's only like the body worker that everyone knows in the horse world. That's fine. I'm so fine. <laughs> okay. okay, I'm going to do it. Okay, let's go. All righty, guys. Here we are. We have Jim Masterson on the line. Say hi. Hello. <laughs> okay, so for, some of, so for someone who is somehow not aware of who you are, would you mind giving the listeners an idea of what you do and a bit about how you got into body work? Okay. Um, yeah, uh, well, uh, the Masterson method is the type of body work that I do. I, um, I called it the Masterson method because when I, when I was working on horses, working on, you know, mostly hunter jumpers, it was integrated decline performance body work because that kind of described what it was. Mm -hmm. Um, but it is kind of hard to describe because there's a, you end up doing a lot of different modalities, but it's because you're following what the horse is telling you with, with changes in behavior or what I call responses. So, Mm -hmm. um, the my wife said I needed to have a 15 second elevator speech to right. explain what it was in 15 seconds if you're in the elevator with somebody. So it's a method of equine body work where you learn to read and follow the responses of the horse to your touch um, to help it release tension in key junctions of the body that most affect performance. So mm-hmm. it's a type of uh, perf- uh, body work 
Um, it's not massage necessarily. It's not chiropractic. It's somewhere in the middle because there are, are some movement techniques that we use. But it's to loosen up, release tension that's accumulated in the horse's body to help it move and perform better. So awesome. That would be in a nutshell. That is a. a it, is. it sounds like you have had to say that a couple times. <laughs> you got it. Yeah, a couple times. <laughs> yeah, I think I think that's incredible, and I think it's something that doesn't really get looked at a lot in like maybe the lower level type riding or the casual riders recreation uh-huh. type things. I think most most of the big time performance horses or people that are working to get there are the ones that think about them like athletes. But I think yeah. um, this will be great for this podcast because a lot of my listeners are people that just have one horse or are trying to, you know, do a lot of work at Liberty with them and maybe they don't ride or do a bunch of competitive stuff so um you know bringing that to the table as well of course a lot of them do still show and stuff like that but um i think that you've got a wide range here (laughs) to cover and talk to yeah it does cover a wide range because you you know i started doing this messing with it when i was grooming hunter jumpers Mm -hmm. um and i noticed when therapists massage therapists or chiropractors or whatever when they were working on horses for owners or trainers um i noticed these little subtle changes in the horse's behavior while they were you know working on them such as you know subtle like the eye might blink or twitch or the lips might twitch or uh, they might there might be a change in breathing (laughs) and and so i was intrigued by that because i never really was interested in doing any kind of therapy with horses or people i was just more interested in getting massaged myself but Mm -hmm. um i did notice these these subtle changes and so i started experimenting with it and playing with it and it turned out that there uh if you if you if you start to include the feedback from the horse while you're working on the horse you it it makes any modality so much more effective because pretty soon the horses start the horse starts to work with you and it starts to release tension on its own yes you don't have to mechanically you know separate muscle fibers and massage the horse you can search for something that the horse is covering up because they survive by blocking out right. pain and tension. And if you don't put pressure on the horse while you're searching, then they have nothing to block brace against. And if you're right. paying attention to those subtle, what I call responses, which is any change in behavior that correlates with what you're doing with your hands, then they'll start, you'll find where there's tension. And if you just stay and wait long enough without putting pressure, the horse will start to, the horse's nervous system will start to release the, the tension. And then you'll know when the tension is released by other changes in behavior. So uh, larger responses. So it, it turns out it was super effective. And, and I, I, was wor- I worked on show horses for nine years and I worked on lots, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds a year, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and so it worked. But the thing is, the cool thing about it is that people wanted to start to learn it because it's very interactive with the horse. Right. So horse owners started to want to, to learn it and it's teachable because you just have to learn how to pay attention to the horse and learn a few basic techniques. So then all of a sudden, like you said, your audience, individual horse owners, um, became interested in it. And so it turned into me teaching it, and now it's turned into a seminar business. So I have instructors that teach also, and um, it's very learnable, and it's effective both. And it's fun because it's interactive with the horse. So how can you beat that? Right, and uh, I think that there are going to be a couple heads with their headphones in or in their car nodding to this a lot because um, what we like a lot of people that listen to this podcast do positive reinforcement and clicker training and I do myself the predominant focus of it is to make it super collaborative because 90% of the time when we're doing positive reinforcement work we're at liberty and you know there's nothing nothing connecting you to the horse except for an intangible string to the food per se (laughs) Uh but um I love what you said about, you know, that that you're really working with the horse, you're paying attention to their feedback, because I think, and it it goes for any type of training, positive or negative reinforcement, if you Mm -hmm. have so much of an agenda that, you know, the relationship gets overlooked, and that you're like, I just need to accomplish this goal, or get this behavior, get this Mm -hmm. response, get this, you know, muscle junction moving again, or Mm -hmm. the... I, I go to see a chiropractor a lot. So like, you know, a lot of it is just fix it, fix it, fix it. Instead yeah. of why, why is it not staying fixed? And so I think, I think that's a really brilliant thing to include in body work and not just training that the horse has an input and things will go so much smoother if you can figure out how to respond appropriately to the horse's input and work with mm-hmm. them and, you know, figure out a way to make it worth it for them. 
Um, yes. That's a lot of what so we that, do. Yeah. Yeah. So that they want to do it. Like they, 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 the horses, uh, they're still survival animals, you know, it's gotta, they, that's gotta feel safe for them. And so a lot of times we can get them to do things that they don't feel entirely safe to do, but it's right. the better best, you know, it's the best we, that they can do or we, we can offer them. So, yeah. And uh, that's, I think an issue you know, that I've taking into. the pressure off the horse, not, it's not just taking, putting pressure on and taking off mm-hmm. it's, it, with this, you're not even putting pressure on. Right. You're just, you're, you're paying attention to subtle responses so that you can tell where the horse has tension and it's the same nervous system whether you're training a horse or Mm -hmm. getting the horse to release tension so that's kind of where the the overlap is with the kind of training that you do I think yeah very true very true and I think um, an issue that I've run into quite a bit with um, you know having my own horse chiropracted and having muscle therapists out or massage therapists um, is that um, especially since she's clicker trained a lot of the time she knows she has a choice now, whereas before she was just kind of like shut down and, you know, I could put a halter on her or I could not. And she would just stand there and, you know, mm-hmm. look dead inside and or she would have an opinion about it and be running away from them. And they would be giving me a sideways look like, do I really have to work on your horse? I'm going to jack your price up. Um, uh, and so yeah. lately I found that it works better to have her worked on with um you know at liberty but i still work with her um using food rewards and i can i always get so frustrated because i'm like i'm i feel like i'm sacrificing something here because if i'm using food rewards and i'm having to cue her for things to keep her mind off of what the muscle therapist is doing it's kind of defeating the purpose isn't it I mean, like what you're saying that you're looking for feedback and for the horse to relax and you're drawing their nervous system's attention to this area that is a point of contention in their body. So in order to (laughs) like, it's kind of like, so the mm. one thing that is the one thing that, that, uh, when you're working with a horse doing this type of body work, um, you, you, you have to throw away the clock and and allow the horse Mm -hmm. time to feel what's going on and feel and release it. So you kind of have to, you, you can't have an agenda like you said you can't right. have an agenda and and um because even if you have an agenda a, a mental agenda the horse is going to pick up on it and they're going to internally brace against it so um you have to give the horse time but all, also while you, every once in a while while you're working on the horse you step back just to see what it has to say and take all the pressure off and and if you've gotten some good releases of tension they'll drop their head and lick and chew and maybe start to yawn repeatedly and um but often if you step back that that when they start to feel what's going on, they look for a distraction. And sometimes the distraction is food. So if there's mm-hmm. food on the, on the ground, they'll go over and start eating it. So, but you right. have to, you can't let them eat because that blocks it out. Food's the one thing that blocks it out. So kind of like, if I'm hearing what you're saying is uh, about a little bit about defeating the purposes, you got to give the horse the opportunity to feel what's going on right. in its body and, um, and not distract itself. So, uh, right. and that's when they release the tension. Yeah, it's almost, it it definitely does. And from what I know about, um, you know, equine behavior and their, the way that they communicate in their language, uh, you know, like you say, grazing can absolutely be a distraction, but I think it also can be a, um, like kind of a calming or distance increasing signal to other members Mm -hmm. of the herd. So it's a block of vulnerability, you know, they're like, Oh, nope, we're good. I'm fine over here. And just kind of skirting it instead of standing, feeling and facing it. And so I think that that's, that's absolutely makes sense. It's just kind of difficult (laughs) when Uh my mare is like, no, but then again, we're not using Masterson method. It is a massage therapist or muscle therapist um, you know, that really gets in there and it's hard for horses to understand this will yeah. might make you feel better, you know? Um, yeah. so that brings me to another question. So you're saying that, you know, you don't want to let them eat, but also offer them feedback, allow them a choice and throw away the clock. So do you ever work at Liberty with horses, like no ropes or anything tied to them so that they have a choice to stay or to leave and have you found no, a difference no i work in a stall with them without a lead rope or without a halter even, okay. or in a small paddock you know because mm-hmm. uh, I'll, I'll step back and give them a chance to you know feel what's going on i, I call it um step back and see what they have to say right. and often you know when they start to feel what's going on in their body it, it's a little uncomfortable and they want to leave so I, ideally if, if you work in a small paddock you can step back and they might walk to the other corner mm-hmm. and then they'll do what they're going to do. If there's no food on the ground, then they'll, 
and they then and a lot of times they try to block it out because it they feel it makes them feel vulnerable when they when this stuff starts coming up okay but if you give them enough time and take the pressure off then they'll feel a release and they'll give you a response like one of the release responses you know snorting sneezing looking chewing yawning and then if you stay back usually they'll come back to you but if you if you keep up right close to them then they they won't, they won't come to you usually and every horse is different because some horses right. feel more comfortable with this than other but if, but if i if i work at liberty with the horse i'm they they may they may decide okay that's good that's enough that's all i want because it's uncomfortable you know to, and it's vulnerable for this stuff to come up right so and if you so if you have lots of time and you can work on your horse every day and and you could work, do a little bit at liberty and then after maybe five minutes they're going to wander off and mm-hmm. that's fine and then the next day you can do five minutes more but usually i'm not in a situation where i can Right. Do that, you know, when I'm working yeah. on a horse. So. It's not entirely practical. Yeah. I think uh, that's something that I would have to think on a little bit more um, on, like, if there is a way to make it to – I just don't know. I would have to think about that a lot because it's kind of one of those medical procedures, like – deworming it must be done but they're they're probably not going to enjoy it and there are procedures that you can do with clicker training to help them you know be more willing or take it voluntarily mm-hmm. and i wonder if there's something that you well you can do. experiment with it you know everything yeah. the way i look at everything we do with the horse is an experiment when we're doing this type of body work Absolutely. we're asking what's going on here and then there we're sit, we're going to wait and see what they have to say and then we're going to focus on that area and give them a chance to release some tension there and there's techniques that involve movement too we have really light techniques where there's no movement Mm -hmm. and we have techniques where you move when you move a joint or a junction or a muscle through a range of motion in a relaxed state that you'll you'll release tension in that but it's about the relaxation not so much about the movement right um so so you could experiment maybe you would let them you work at liberty you do a little work you step back and you got to step you know you step way back so that Mm -hmm. they don't feel any pressure and then they'll do what they're going to do. And then you might experiment, you know, clicking and that thing to get them to come back. To yeah. You. I mean, I would experiment with it. it, it, it and the, the way I look at it is you can cheat as long as it works. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. And I mean, that's that's how I felt with like the Murdoch method pads and the Surefoot pads. Um, uh-huh. I'm, I mat trained my mare. So she knows that if I throw it like a doormat, you know, a cheap doormat on the ground, she knows to go stand on it. Um, huh. but with the Murdoch method, Matt, I was like, let's not do clicker training. This is supposed to be an authentic, you know, organic experience. You can just step on it however you'd like. And, uh, she, she was like, I don't get it. I'm not doing that unless you cue me. <laughs> uh-huh. And then I, when I cued her to stand on it, she was like, both front feet good. And I was like, okay, but you're defeating the purpose. You're supposed to stand <laughs> however you would like. And she's like, no, I'm, but look, I'm doing it right, mom. <laughs> so, uh-huh. Um, well, and... the purpose, the goal of the body work is to release tension right. in the horse. So, you know, that it's not to uh, have them the have horse a to goal. volunteer. Right. You know, it's, so if it's working, then the way I look at it, you can cheat if it works. Yeah, uh, I, I agree with that. So but you, um... you I, it's interesting. You probably have to experiment with that if you could, you know, um, if a lot of times if they have a choice, they don't want to deal with the pain and tension. That's how they survive. They right. survive by blocking it out. They have no option really in the wild. If they start to limp when they're sore, then they become a target. So they're programmed, you know, mm-hmm. even unconsciously, they're just programmed to block it out. That's why it's hard to evaluate lameness in horses a lot of times. Right. They don't want to show it until it becomes so bad that they, they have to show it. Right. So. And I mean, I don't know, though. I'm sitting here thinking about it. And, you know, generally speaking, I'm not the biggest proponent for what we would call negative reinforcement, you know, the pressure and release type training. However, I think like, obviously it has a place, there are circumstances and it's totally fine for people to train that way. I have a, I have a few caveats about that, but you know, anyone listening can listen to literally any other episode of the podcast for more on that. But um, I do think in this situation, um, and you know, of course I'd have to think more about it to like really suss it out for myself, but I do think that this is probably one of the most subtle, quiet um, forms of negative reinforcement because you are, you're touching the horse in a way that they are going to experience some level of discomfort, even if it's like so below threshold that they they might not even be consciously noticing it, but it's happening yeah. with their nervous system. And then when you hold it or take it off, there is a release happening within their body, whether or not your hand is actually coming off and releasing 
like Mm -hmm. literally, um, but their body is giving a release. So, you know, it's possible that um, that feeling would be so good. And it's so subtle because traditional negative reinforcement is, you know, like you pull back on rain, horse stops, you release, horse is reinforced. So, but you're directly applying. This isn't really, this isn't really, you're not using pressure. Right. You know, with it, especially with the really light technique. So the bladder meridian technique is the, is the lightest it's technique. More of an we use. awareness. And you can actually go on our website, and and we have a whole mm-hmm. bunch of YouTube videos teaching people how to do really um, a lot of things, but basic techniques. And the bladder meridian technique is a technique where you you start up at the pole and you follow the bladder meridian line, which is just mm-hmm. it's a it's a it's a Chinese medicine meridian. But you don't even have to follow that; you can do it anywhere on the horse's body. But let's say you start up at the pole and you just barely touch the hair behind the ear, and you you don't you're not even touching the skin. And then you slowly run your fingers down the top line, just off the top line, following that line, and you look watch the horse's eye for a blink. And if you get a blink then you stay there and do nothing. You don't push, you don't rub it, you don't do anything. All you have to do is keep the horse's awareness on that spot long enough for its nervous system to start to let the tension go because they have a certain amount of uh, sympathetic nervous system activity to, to block out pain and tension. Mm-hmm. You know, that's the survival part, the, the fight, flight, or freeze. Right. And so you stay there long enough and that starts to let go and then the parasympathetic starts to kick in, which is the rest and regenerate. And then they'll start to drop their head and then they might let out a big sigh and like and chew and yawn. So you've just kept their awareness on it long enough for them. So in a sense you are keeping the pressure on, but you're not using physical pressure right. to do it. So Yeah, it's it's like a an awareness pressure. Because in, in negative reinforcement typically we talk about um you know, it doesn't even necessarily have to be pressure. I mean, you standing yeah, next it can to... Be, yeah, just, right. you know, moving the horse around and around. You're not right. even touching it. Right, exactly. And yet it is negative reinforcement. So yeah. um, it's it's almost like you're using awareness <laughs> instead. Because, I mean, you are physically touching the horse, but unless the horse well, you, has... it's interesting because some horses you can't even touch them. They're so sore. But you can do it. You back your hand away. Like if you put your hand... A lot of horses are head shy. And, then, mm-hmm. and they're head shy for a reason. That's not... a trained behavior it's because right. they have physical discomfort and you can touch them up there maybe with put pressure on their pole but when you back off to a and, and to a point where you they can't brace against it you might have your fingers three or four or five inches away from the pole and then all of a sudden their eyes their head comes down a little bit and so you stay at that distance that is really you're just, interesting you're just doing you're doing staying at a distance where they're feeling it that they can't internally brace against it. right and see i feel like I feel like that might not make sense to everyone, but the the analogy that just popped into my head, I think might clarify it because like if you've ever seen a horse have like a bot fly or a something buzzing that one of those bugs that just hovers like by their knees or something, Mm -hmm. and then Mm -hmm. they, they put an ear on it and they kind of freeze. I would imagine that Mm -hmm. having your hand like three to five inches hovering above their pole would very much do the same thing. And their Uh attention is fully focused on that spot. So, mm-hmm. uh, you know, between their ears, I mean, that makes perfect sense to me. But yeah, and you, you back away until you see them just relax a tiny bit. Mm. And then that's where you'll stay because they're, they're not able to internally brace against that. So, yeah. Um, and I and f- that's what gets the process going. It just, their, it you just know, goes nervous system starting to let go. So hand in hand with everything that I do and yeah. what I believe in and try to promote on this podcast is that everything is about relaxation. You never want... Mm-hmm. A blow up or you know there shouldn't be all these crazy horses running around doing all this nonsense that's like we have all these wild hot horses we want oh, yeah. them to be relaxed and calm and actually enjoying work or life or whatever you do with them and yeah. i think that that's that's just so cool that traditional like body work methods or actually they're probably not traditional they're probably the more modern ones are so all about like kind of showiness like listen to those pops and see how much the horse shakes after this or um you know just looking for the biggest thing instead of the subtlest thing which is the nature of horses is so incredibly subtle so Mm -hmm. i think it just what you do matches up so much better with what the horse is as an entity you know um so um sometimes you know people will work on their horses doing this this type of body work and they have a lot more time and they and they'll work work on them at liberty and then so they'll uh they give the, you know the horse will go off and then 
the horse might come back a little later and they'll do a little more but at some point often they'll release enough tension that they just won't go anywhere because you know their head drops to the ground it's amazing how much horses can be holding on to and blocking out for years and years and years and years Mm -hmm. and you come along i mean i get emails all the time from people that have done the bladder meridian on their horse they went on youtube and so on yeah they went out and tried it and their horse just like lay down and this is a horse that's never laid down and i hear that a lot and then it lay slept for like 30 minutes and it's just let go of something and it's been holding on in its nervous system and it's jarred it's jarred its nervous system at some point Mm -hmm. and it finally had a chance to let go um and then that that horse will stick around probably a little longer Mm -hmm. but um you know when i would when i worked on show horses you had a you know i had a list of horses every day the trainer would give me at different barns and and i'd go down the list so i didn't have the time to to wait and i find that people that are have learned this from me since then often do a better job than i do because they don't have that you know time Time, thing in the back of their head you have to throw away the clock but you know you have to get all these horses done at the same time so you know it's it's hard to let go of that yeah for sure Uh, i definitely feel you in that regard because um it's it just seems like if you have 10 minutes to spend with them it will take all all of your week and if you have a whole week, then it'll take 10 minutes. <laughs> and yeah, all right. So, um, yeah, I guess I just, going back to, like, the chiropractor and more, um, you know, harsher kind of manipulation type adjustments, like, how did it feel for you to sort of go against the grain? Like, how did you know it was right? Because I understand that you worked with a chiropractor, right, before? Like, that's how you got into this, well, right? Well, I, I was when I was grooming, um, mm-hmm. you know, our trainer had a couple of things happen. Like our trainer uh, would have massage therapists and chiropractors work on the horses, but she had this one uh, guy and the vets, uh, you know, uh, the vet, a vet practice on the East Coast that we use that was pretty well known in the show, on our jumper world would have this guy come in. He was in, from New Zealand and he was a horse. He does an old horse chiropractor. He'd been doing it for 40 years. He, he learned from some other old guy in New Zealand, been doing it for 40 years. And he used very long lever forceful mm-hmm. techniques, but he really read the horse. You know, after he did an adjustment, he would step back to see what the horse had to say. Mm-hmm. And if he got a good adjustment, the horse would start to, would drop its head and maybe shake a little bit its head and then start yawning repeatedly. So, um, uh, though, 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 that was a sign to him that he got a good adjustment. So I was intrigued by that, and I wanted to do what he did. But you know, I don't know how many years it took him to 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 learn to do this without you know hurting a horse because it was pretty forceful. Mm-hmm. But um, I used to follow him around whenever he, he was at the sh- a show where we were at, and I'd hold the leap rope for, for him, and and I just pay attention, and and I and I. Uh, I learned that you could actually, if you, rather than doing a, a huge movement all at once, if you broke it down, like going down the neck, I call it lateral cervical flexion, and you just gently wiggle your way down the neck and you're moving each vertebra in a relaxed state, that you you would get the, the, the same response. You know, all of a sudden the horse would let go of tension and start yawning. But, but before I even I started messing with movement, um, I was at another a horse show in Estes Park, Colorado with the trainer when I was grooming. And she had these two ladies come and massage our horses. And they started with that bladder meridian. They would run their hand slowly down the bladder meridian to relax the horse before they started massaging it. And I noticed as they were doing that, that along the way, the horse would blink every once in a while. And mm-hmm. I could see the horse was feeling something. So I, I uh, started experimenting it. And I, and I would run my hand down that bladder meridian. And if I got a blink, my first thought was, well, was that me or was that just the horse blinking? Right. Well, if I went back over and I went down the same line and the horse blinked at the exact same spot, then that was there was a correlation there mm-hmm. between what I was doing and he was doing. And then since I wasn't trained to do anything like massage it or anything, I did... And I'm also naturally lazy. I just sit there, wait there with my hand resting lightly there. And the horse would continue to blink and it might start to drop its head and drop its head. And then it start to yawn and look at you and yawn. So it was, it was giving the same responses that the, that the chiropractor got when right. he stood back to see what the horse had to say. So there was a connection there. So that's what really got me interested in this. And so I started experimenting with it and started adding movement but like for example as you're going down the neck and you're gently wiggling the horse's nose and moving your hand down the where the vertebrae of the neck go and you just wiggle and soften and wiggle and soften if you hit a spot where there's tension so and you wiggle it the horse will will brace it'll tense it, and our natural reaction is to tense against it but i, I untensed when i when the horse started to tense i softened 
when I softened, the horse would let go of that tension. And then it, and then I could wiggle on through that spot and the horse would start to yawn. So all those little, you know, it was just a learning process. And, and, um, it, it turns out that it worked. It worked really well because, you know, you can't work on show horses and keep doing it if you don't get results. It was about results. So I think your question was, you know, did I feel like I was going against the flow? No, I don't feel like I was going against the flow. I feel like I was doing something that was really working. And, yeah. um, and it was, it, it was the interacting with the horse at the same time. So uh, that's kind of how I got started on it. And then, like I said, people wanted to learn it because it is interactive and they love that you know, seeing the horse release tension as they're doing it. Yeah. And so you get, you get results as you're doing the body work because you can actually see when it's happening. And then you get results afterwards when you get on your horse and all of a sudden you can bend to the right a little better right. or you can pick up the canter loop a, that he had trouble with before. A lot of positive reinforcement for the handler. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I think it just takes a special kind of person to, you know, because everyone has yeah, seen yeah, it, it, massage. Yeah, someone who is uneducated and lazy. Yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> but honestly, though, most people would be like, oh, the horse is blinking. Okay, let me do that again. Oh, he's blinking. I should massage this spot because he's probably sore uh, there. And Well, that's the lazy part. Yeah, but I mean, that's... you got to be net. have to have a little laziness. Hey, lazy has a bad connotation, and what you did has no bad connotation whatsoever. <laughs> I think well, the horses patient, probably yeah. appreciate that, yeah. Um, so... So to that point, how much of a role does the handler play or the one applying your method or how much do you matter in the circumstance, you know, because I imagine that there is uh, a few few ways this could go negatively <laughs> for you. And I'm one of them. I've tried this several times and I've only been successful with horses that are kind of um, let's say patient is the better word than lazy. We said, um, uh -huh. <laughs> at baseline, yeah. uh, you know, like when the farrier's working on them or something and I'm just trying to get them to be nice so that they aren't wiggly and, um, they, they tend to fall asleep, but the horses that tend to be a little bit hotter or, um, just a little bit more anxious in general, it's mm -hmm. harder to, help them relax so how much how much relaxed do you have to be <laughs> you know? well you you have to you have to re, you have to be you know relaxed when you're going to work with the horse and you have to learn not to react when the horse reacts you know when the horse spooks then or pulls away you have to learn not to pull back or not to jump so <clears throat> pretty soon it becomes automatic you know say you're leading the horse or you're holding the horse and then he pulls his head away it, you automatically automatically yield mm -hmm. so you're holding the lead rope you yield automatically and the horse doesn't feel any resistance so it stops pulling back right. so it'd be you know that's a big part of it you know okay and it's counterintuitive you know a lot of times we don't even know we're holding pressure on the horse because we're just used to that level of pressure but right you know if you're holding the lead rope and the horse's head pulls up if you yield and get ahead of it you you give the horse slack before it even puts tension in the lead rope mm -hmm. the horse will stop pulling right because there's nothing there to pull against right and and so that's a big part of it it's a little counterintuitive but you, as you practice it gets better and better and pretty soon just becomes automatic and you know if you're handling a leg and the, you feel the horse start to pull the leg away if you learn to yield before the horse uh you know the horse feels you're you pulling back you learn to just right you know yield an inch you I... feel it coming in you yield oh. an inch the horse will usually stop pulling his leg away because yes. he's not feeling anything i wish i wish more Hoof professionals knew that. I had to have a conversation about that with my personal farrier because my mare has arthritic hocks. And if you pick her foot up, her hind foot up, and you take it away from her, she'll kick she's you. She's going to pull it. Right. Yeah. Because she's like, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God, and goes into panic mode. But if you mm -hmm. kindly ask her to pick her foot up and just kind of, you know, hover your hand around it, support it, and let her mm -hmm. kind of work it out and then settle, she's totally mm -hmm. fine. She doesn't, she doesn't mind at yeah. all. And um, had to have a conversation about that. <laughs> well, it's natural for her to protect her hind. Exactly. And, and, and so, you know, we have hind leg releases that we do that help release tension in the pelvis and the mm -hmm. sacral lumbar. And you you ask for the horse's foot and if you bring it up forward. And it's the, as soon as you can, you let go of the skin. You get under the front of the toe off the ground. Mm -hmm. And you let the horse rest in your hand there. I call it the barrier position because it's like they're on a hoof stand. Oh, yeah. So you, And it's easier for the horse to bring the leg forward than back. So you, you, you can sometimes just tap the foot and they'll lift it up. You get under the toe and then allow them to rest in your hand there. And they'll relax their haunch. They'll relax their, their pelvis and their leg. And then from there, you can slowly go down and back, you know, yeah. to 
clean the foot or whatever. So, but you just give them that opportunity before you even start doing something to relax that leg. Yeah. Uh, for example, in that situation. Uh, see, I we talked about this before we got on the podcast, and now I'm like, I need to go grab my horse and go do these yeah. things. <laughs> I'm itching. Okay, so um, is there like a certain mindset that you find makes this process more powerful? Like you, you mentioned throwing away the clock. Is there another one? Um, yeah, learning not to react when the horse reacts. Yeah. You know, because uh, um, they're a herd animal, and mm-hmm. they react, you react, they react, you react. And then soon, right. You know, when, when they react and you don't even move, you just stand there calmly. And, and again, it just takes a little practice. Yes. <clears throat> then they, they look, it's almost like they look around like, oh, that was embarrassing. I'm the only one that <laughs> feels the, you know, the need to run. You never, you never saw a scared horse run away from the herd. They're all just right. sitting there eating. So yeah. you just that's just a mindset that helps but that kind of comes automatically the more you practice doing the body work. I, I think um, so too I actually did talk about this in my last episode I believe that um you know I work with a lot of young off the track thoroughbreds and in working with my mare you know she's I think 10 now and I've had her since she was a three-year-old and we used to be very good at that spiraling up together and uh, making the other more and more anxious and now that I've gotten to a place, you know, I'm more mature working with younger horses and with her. Now it's a lot easier for me to just take a couple deep breaths, you know, been also listening uh-huh. to Warwick's podcast on mindfulness and how important it is that you pay attention to your own mental and emotional state around them and um, just remaining calm and trying to be more of a a rock relaxing calm presence for them i've seen that happen so many times what you're saying that they just go oh my god yeah. oh nobody's freaking out okay <laughs> yeah, sorry my bad freaking out. how embarrassing <laughs> yeah exactly you know? um yeah. so another question i had was can this method be applied to humans um i don't know you i know, know the bladder meridian really, can. you know i think it works really well with horses and it, and it works with dogs mm-hmm. because um they don't have uh, they don't. They're not analyzing every everything. Right. You know, they don't. We have a record playing all the time, and mm-hmm. we don't even know it. You know, so if you're running your, I'll use the bladder meridian as an example because that kind of is the best example. You're running your hand down the bladder meridian really lightly, and you're watching the horse's eye for a response. When it feels something, it'll give you a re- subtle response. Right. And, um, because there's a direct connection. They're just being there, waiting. Right. You know. Very and with present. a human, you know, the human's going to be laying there thinking, "Well, what the heck's this person doing now?" This isn't. Am I paying for this? Uh, you know, I, I hope he's done soon. I got to get to the, you know, <laughs> right. the store. You know, we have that playing, and so I don't know that there's a direct connection. But I, you know, I've, I've talked to really good body, you know, human body workers that they really tune into the human and they can feel when there's a, you know, a change. So I'm, it, it might work. The same same principle work with humans, but you probably have to be really tuned into the human and the, and have the patience to wait for the human to get bored enough to fall asleep you know yeah. what you're doing it I don't know yeah I I remember I tried the bladder meridian one time on myself because I looked it up and it is a it is a human thing um and I I just remember I was at my boss's house sitting on a bar stool and I was like well I can do this and I put my two thumbs behind my behind my head on my neck and started running uh-huh. down it and immediately like didn't even make it to my like back and yawned and I was like I'm not tired I didn't placebo myself because I did not oh. think this was going to work. And I was like, that is very weird. Um, so, and That's then of course I tried it again and did not get a yawn. So I'm a bad horse. <laughs> but maybe I released something. Who knows? Um, I just wondered because I feel like a lot of riders deal with a lot of tension and pain as well, well which can't help you the know, horses. Certainly if you do what you just described, it's, cer- it's probably going to give you a little bit more self-awareness mm-hmm. of what's going on with yourself. Yeah. It probably is going to quiet your mind down a little bit because you're going to be paying attention to what you're doing. So, yeah, it is mindfulness. Um, yeah. Yeah, so... Um, but it, a lot of people we're finding use the bladder meridian in equine-assisted therapy, you know, with working with um, uh, like at-risk kids yeah. um so we do have like a we have a training program for that to use that's so cool the bladder meridian in that setting because it, it what it does is it, it, even just normal a normal a normal adult it really quiets your mind down because what, all of a sudden you're you're running your finger down this line that you know where it mm-hmm. is and you're you know what to look for in the horse and so you start doing it and you pretty soon you'll find your your mind's quieted down yeah because you're tuning you're just paying attention to the horse so 
it, it's I think it's pretty therapeutic for humans I to think, just be yeah. mindfulness and pay attention to that. Yeah, that um, is actually plays into my next question, which was on how do you think your method changes the relationship between the horse and human pair for each party? And I think I, I have never considered it because I am actually studying to get my master's in clinical mental health counseling. Um, oh, okay. So it's that's actually a really interesting point that you you have to focus on this. And if you're anywhere else in your head, it's not going to work. So I think that that definitely that makes a lot of sense it, that it, it kind of happens automatically, mm-hmm. you know, it yeah. kind of just happens automatically. And, and I'll, um, so that's kind of interesting. And, um, another thing that starts to happen is like, sometimes, you know, some people have better feel than others. When you're doing movement techniques, you have to learn to, to, to yield when the horse braces and you have to learn how to ask for movement in a relaxed state. <clears throat> and some people th- say, well, you can't teach feel, but actually you can, you know, when you, we have a set of techniques that you start to practice, you know, to release tension in your horse. And in the process of learning how to do those kind of techniques correctly, you, you, you learn the feel from doing the techniques over and over again. And the horse gives you the feedback on that too, because bracing is feedback. You know, when the horse braces against something you're at, you're asking it's feedback from the horse and you learn to soften when you get that feedback pretty soon, it just becomes softening becomes automatic. Right. And I would imagine that that would kind of be a carryover skill that once you learn how to genuinely watch the horse and pay attention and develop your feel, then, yeah. you know, it carries over. And also, I also don't agree with that because, I mean, I've definitely met a couple people that I am shocked that they haven't injured themselves yet with horses. Mm-hmm. Um, but, I mean, when we all started out, we didn't know what we were looking for. And just being with them, I guess some people might learn it faster than others. But I definitely think it can be teachable. Uh, uh. And I yeah, imagine, it, yeah, can some people I have better feel than others, and they, you know, and and young people I find young people that come to one of our seminars or our courses, you know, they haven't learned how to brace yet, mm-hmm. and they they're they're usually the best, you know, and and they don't they don't overthink things. You show them how to do something, and they do it, and you say, okay, well, just change this a little and this a little, and they do it even better, right. and then they stand there like, okay, what's next? But adult learners, you know, people my age you know we question things all the time and we you know we're analyzing it we're not yeah. we're doubting that it's really working and we have all these reasons why it won't work and it's not working and 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 young people kids just kind of pick it up just exactly. like that it's pretty neat. yeah one of my clients right now is 14 and i when i first started teaching her about clicker training she picked it up faster than i did when i started and i started like <laughs> 3 years ago and i was like well this is annoying cuz i think you're about to pass me <laughs> And yeah. I am not going to know what to do in that scenario. And I'm just going to have to pretend <laughs> that I know where I'm going with this because you're very good at it. And I have a, a timeline. You're ruining it. Um, but, yeah, I, I definitely agree. I think that's very cool. And I wish it was something that was kind of a baseline that was taught in Barnes because I think that there's such a big focus on the riding and the competing And Mm -hmm. what a lot of barns are doing now, I think, um, and I know some, you know, of my clicker trainer buddies that are starting it, they do everything. I mean, they, they have lessons on just, you know, grooming far Mm -hmm. into the program too, not just at the very beginning and medical procedures and asking the horse, do you want to do this today? Are you comfortable Mm -hmm. with this? Are you sore here? And I think if your method um, you know, at least in some capacity could be applied to horses and taught to kids that are working with them and just getting started out, I think we would have a lot more of a compassionate and better educated uh, yeah. industry. Because um, there is a whole other aspect of horses, you know, that kind of people aren't aware of and doing when they come and do these seminars that they, they get, they see that, you mm-hmm. know, how, how sensitive the horse is, but everybody knows they're sensitive, but you know, how uh, how subtle their behavior and their right. responses are, how subtle they are. And the cool thing that is that um, when you get what the horse is saying, I mean, it's huge. You're, you're paying attention to feedback. It's a huge uh, breakthrough in anything you're doing with the horse. But what's really cool, and I was talking to, when I was talking with Warwick about this, is when the, the horse gets that you get it, that mm-hmm. it's a whole nother dimension. Yeah. They just start to trust you and go with you because they know you're paying attention to it. All their subtle little little their subtle language you know you're paying attention to it and you're responding to it exactly something that i definitely talk about a lot on this podcast is um a book by a woman named raquel dreisma and it's called language signs and calming signals are you familiar with it 
Um, it sounds kind of familiar. Yeah, but it's, I, I haven't read it. Well, it's language signs and calming signals of horses. I forgot that part. Um, but it is. She basically just did kind of an independent study over how horses communicate and what they could mean and how they relate to the horse's, you know, threshold and triggers and things like that. And it's a really interesting book. And I recommend it to everyone who's getting started because so much of my training and what I do focuses on keeping the horses below threshold, keeping them relaxed and willing. So, um, you know, you have to be able to see and understand when the horse is communicating that it's uncomfortable because horses, the first thing they do is not leave. They don't walk away from you. They're going to tell you that, I don't know about that. That's making me a little bit more uncomfortable first before they leave. But if you miss it, then you just get the leaving. And yeah. eventually the horse wants, doesn't want to interact with you because you're not getting them. I mean, how frustrating would that be in a human to human relationship? So yeah. it's about noticing the head turns or the, I might take a nervous bite of grass or, um, my eye looks a little bit uncomfortable. My nose is scrunched, you know, any, mm-hmm. any just subtle communication I think is mm-hmm. such an important part of horses. And I think a lot of people, unfortunately are just taught ear pin equals bad and Mm -hmm. ears forward is happy and (laughs) there's there's such a deeper level and sometimes the horse gets a smack for telling you it's unhappy yes (laughs) yes and that's actually um i was gonna ask you that um do you have any stories that like stand out to you about a horse whose pain was misinterpreted because we're very much on this podcast all about like oh i mean it it happens all the time and you know you think it's a behavior horses it's a training issue or a behavior Mm -hmm. issue and the horse is telling you that that's uncomfortable for it to do you know so i mean it happens all the time a buck, bucking, you know. Yep. It, you know, unless it's a pony that's been taught that the kid flies up really easy when it does that, you know, it's trained to buck. Then, other than that, all of a sudden, if your horse starts bucking, there there's a reason for it, and mm-hmm. you, usually there's a physiological component to it. Um, lead swapping, you know, or they, or oh, they're, yep. you, your horse, you just can't pick up the right lead is just uncomfortable. The, it's rough, you know, and the horse one. won't pick up the right lead. And so you train it and train it and train it until it picks up the right lead. Well, it didn't decide one morning uh, with its buddies, hey, let's not pick up the right lead right. this morning. It, that didn't happen. It's something that's physical that's making it uncomfortable to, or, for the horse. So it happens all the time. Yeah. And, it, and it doesn't have to be a big, huge thing. It could be subtle things, you know, small things like that. Right. That, um, I you know, misinterpreted. I am 100% with you on that one. Um, I historically with my mare uh, did not score well in dressage because I'm sure, especially you as a body worker, if you looked at her, you know, some footage of her in dressage, you would be like, that is, that is absolutely painful to watch because she was just, she was a a rubber band ball ready to explode Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. um, constant tail swishing and just would skip behind like a small Mm -hmm. child skipping with her hind leads and you know i had her evaluated by several different vets they all Mm -hmm. said she was just a hot mare i rode under a bunch of olympians she's a hot Mm -hmm. mare she needs this Mm -hmm. bit you need to ride her with a bridge rein and Mm -hmm. you know she's fine maybe we inject her hawks oh she's not better i don't know what the problem is until one day somebody shot me a message on twitter of all places and was like have you ever looked into kissing spine And I was like, um, no, but now I will. And then I fell down a rabbit hole and started panicking. Long story short, um, she just had kissing spine surgery in April. So, Mm -hmm. um, and the tail swishing is completely gone. Watching her run around in her field, she looks like, you know, your picture perfect Hunter Eck horse. I mean, her, Uh her top line is relaxed. Her tail is soft. She just floats. And, Mm -hmm. um, so it's just it's frustrating that that's so perpetuated through the industry and i'm really grateful that there are professionals like you that are pushing this if the horse is misbehaving it's probably not doing it just because it's an asshole it's probably yeah. doing it because there's something wrong because the horses mm-hmm. aren't stupid they know that there are punishments so um you know i think yeah. that's that's awesome if there's a behavior you're having trouble training your horse out of either you're doing a terrible job of training or if there's a there's a physiological component to it so right and if, if something doesn't work one direction uh if it works one direction worse than the other or it, you know you know what i'm saying it's not even mm-hmm. it's probably not a behavior training thing you can you know there's a physiological component or if something just shows up out of the blue you know a bad behavior it's right. probably 
it's likely there's a you know physical part part to that so right um, and and we just wanted to train them through it and a good trainer can train a horse to deal with a lot of pain and then yeah. they'll get them to do it but it's going to show up down the road you know it's, uh, yeah it's something something's got to give so right. and a, a, you know i i know a really well-known dressage rider who she said when she was young she had this amazing horse a young horse and then she had a trainer, a really well-known trainer, got on the horse, and this horse was so talented, it just had it doing piaffs. I mean, it just was drilling the horse in piaff. And she said, something happened, and then the, it broke the horse. Oh. Physically, something happened. And those are when those things happen, they're up in the core muscles, and the deeper groin muscles and core muscles. And um, the, the, you can't find them. Like, the, they'll check the hocks, stifles, mm-hmm. the back. They'll inject the sacroiliac. might help a little bit. But, but a lot of times the vets can't find those things because something's pulled inside. And she right. said that was a lesson for her. Just because the horse can do it doesn't mean that you're not hurting the horse. It was just right. a talented young horse, but it wasn't conditioned enough to do what the right. trainer was Or was even necessarily it that if the horse is doing it, that they're willing. They might just be avoiding consequences. And <laughs> yes. I think that's a testament to horses that they just, generally speaking, have such big hearts and are so willing, even though their bodies physically aren't there you know most of the time they'll they'll give it to you and that's what my mare did I mean I invented her through training level and I mean she she had been doing the swapping leads and the tail swishing for years and um now her hawks are fusing and she's had kissing spine surgery and I'm sure she's got a host of you know SI issues and is probably uncomfortable internally but um there's a lot <laughs> on my plate yeah, that I'm working really with. Yeah, they really like techniques, you know. They like the hind end points that we that we use. Um, the the lighter you go, the deeper the horse uh, feel, the deeper the tension they feel, and will release. And and I just figured this out, you know, because I've been doing it so long mm-hmm. that uh, if you stay really light and find responses in the lower back area, they'll start to release tension in the core muscles. And um, the lighter you go, the deeper the release is. But mm-hmm. that's how you can access those deeper muscles without, because you can't access them otherwise. Yeah. And, and so, and and usually if there's been an issue, any issue behind or in the back, then the core muscles are going to be involved because they're compensating. The car, right. They're compensating for the discomfort, whatever's going on behind. So core muscles and deeper groin muscles and and, sac- and tension on the sacrum, they all, I, I call it mystery hind end lightness. Mm-hmm. If you really can release tension in all three of those areas a lot of times you'll see an improvement in that mystery hind end lameness and if you i well on on our website we have um i wrote articles for performance horse digest for for about a year you know every mm-hmm. month and i had two two articles in there on mystery hind end lameness explaining you know my take on it and yeah. how you can help release it so if anybody's out there listening that has mystery hind end issues me. You might want to go and look at the mystery hind end lameness articles. Me, I will look website. at them. Because <laughs> yeah. you can do a lot for it yourself. I mean, yeah. Sometimes you can, and I don't like to use word fix because that, that's an agenda. Mm-hmm. Um, but a lot of times you can make a big difference in your horse too is doing these really light, simple techniques. Yeah, and, and I am like, I feel like I'm making up years of error with my mare. And, you know, it's hard not to, like you were talking about that dressage rider, it's hard not to feel like, you've you've destroyed the oh, horse yeah. and so but you don't you don't know you know, no, you don't know what you no. don't know when you're when you're uh, you're you know through your whole life you know you absolutely have to be aware that you don't know what you don't know so you can't really blame yourself at least if you're trying to figure things out then that's the best right. you can do right and i think that it's just it's unfortunate that the horses end up taking the brunt of that because i think that if we'd been able to recognize the subtle signs of pain because it didn't start with the you know swapping leads behind or the tail swishing Uh it probably started with maybe a little high-headedness maybe not fully wanting to get round or relax over the top line and then you know what do most trainers particularly those in arkansas (laughs) you know (laughs) go for apply more pressure make the horse do it he's just being naughty or lazy today and then all of a sudden it's two years later and now your horse is dealing with significant arthritis and so um that is definitely a point of contention for me but um so actually my next question was for a horse like zoe my mare who underwent a major surgery for kissing spine you know are your best you know what the protocol you would do would that be that your hind end mystery lameness protocol 
Well, yeah. I mean, you we you know, I you work on the whole horse no matter what the issue right. is because it's all interconnected. But you you don't have to do it all at once. You know, mm-hmm. you just don't work on the front end every time you work on the horse and not anything else. But um, because you just want to keep the, everything loose and relaxed. You know, those tensegrity models with the rubber bands and the sticks. You know, makes a little. You move them around. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about. I do. Like a, you know, a pyramid or whatever. So you really got to keep the whole body loose and, and working together to keep, that's the best way to look at that, you know? Yeah. Um, like, you know, a lot of times people say, my horse's back is sore. We work on it and say, yeah, I'll work on it. And I started the pole and they say, no, his back is sore. And I know I'm working on his back. <laughs> you know, yes. you work on, you loosen the front end, you loosen the hind end, and then you go to the middle because that's the hardest, the stiffest part. But also another kind of basic principle of this type of body work is you start where it's easiest for the horse and then you release where it's the hardest, you know, because, um, you will already have gotten half the job done by starting where it's easier and allowing the horse to release tension where it's tight right? without focusing on that area. And see, that makes perfect sense to me. I, I'm like sort of judging by my x-rays pre-arthritic and my low back. And I have a lot of neck pain because I compensate everywhere else and running up the large muscles on the back of my back on either side of my spine they're constantly knotted and tight and then it affects my neck and then I deal with headaches all the time but the problem isn't my neck or my headaches the problem is my low back and the discomfort there so it makes perfect sense with horses that if you're seeing something happen somewhere else it might not always just be that <laughs> no it's it, I, I was saying there's it's almost always never just one thing right exactly it's one thing's connected to another and to another and you just you have to pick a place to start and you start there but you want to start where it's the most comfortable for the horse because that way you get them releasing you're relaxing and releasing tension rather than just attacking the problem right and i i think that goes for many facets of horses they really are just the best teachers out there you can't you can't ever just learn one part about them you can't just learn yeah. how to rope you or never how to stop jump. learning you know no. um, um well, we, where are you in Arkansas? Um, I am in, oh God, where am I? I just moved to Royal. It's in the Hot Springs area, if you know where that is. Oh, well, I, I was just, we have an instructor in Hot Springs Village. I just have her up oh. on my website, well, Lori Thompson. Will... And she's a practitioner, and also she teaches weekend seminars down there. So, Well, what the heck? And, and she she would organize one for you if you were interested. Uh, in yeah. Yeah. We just moved out I don't want to do a commercial or anything, but, uh, you know. Please she, do. She's, you know, we do weekend seminars all over the country, and she's in well. Hot Springs Village, if that's anywhere near you. See, this is the dangerous thing. This happened to me with clicker training, too. I was like, nobody clicker trains horses in Arkansas. Sure enough, three hours away, Fayetteville. <laughs> and um, so, and we just moved to a brand new farm. Um, we were on a really small kind of dinky old one that my boss had had for 20 years and now we're on a gigantic fantastic one where we want to host clinics and shows and stuff so i might just have to reach out to her and be like hey lady you want to yeah. come party with us because <laughs> hot springs village i think is it depends where but i mean that's yeah. 30 to 45 minutes or so um but, uh, so i'm on our calendar page now it's in october 9th and 10th she's got a seminar set up in perryville arkansas wherever that is i have heard that so many times but to be honest with you i have no idea where it is so i will have to take a look at your website and see if i can't get yeah go to the courses page and click on the weekend seminars and then you'll scroll down on a calendar and and she and her course is listed there so i will and if you wanted to set up a course a weekend seminar you know we Mm -hmm. uh she she might be interested in doing that too so yeah and i'm sure that goes for the best way to learn is just to get get in get in there with the horses and have somebody put their hands on yours and show you what right. they're doing. So. And I'm sure, cause like I, like I've said, I've done it with a few of our horses before at this point. And, um, I absolutely always have an agenda a hundred percent. I'll be the first to admit it. Um, and I'm like, why isn't it happening? The horse isn't relaxing. Why isn't it releasing? Mm-hmm. Well, Jillian, you are not relaxing. <laughs> the, horse yeah. the horse is probably so tense because of you. The horse um, is waiting yes. for you to let go so mm-hmm. of your agenda so it can let go. Yeah, I think it would be really cool to work with somebody on that. And I'm sure what you your website directions go for many other states and locations if anybody's interested in wanting to oh, yeah. have a seminar or attend one. 
Um, yeah, you can attend one or you can you can contact us and, and if, if you have a facility or know somebody has a facility, you can set one up yeah. and, and pe- people that set them up get to take them for free. So I don't like doing commercials, but anyways, that's well, how you I'm do it. I'm forcing <laughs> you, know? you to um, because I, I always get asked, like people always message me and they're like, no clicker trainers are in my area. And I'm like, have you, have you looked at the map uh, of clicker trainers? And they're like, oh. Well, yeah, there's one an hour away from me. I'm like, well, that's great. <laughs> but so, I mean, if, if people don't know, they don't know. So promote yourself. Yeah. But um, yeah, what did you say her name was again? I'm sorry, I'm still hung up Lo- on this. Lori Thompson. Lori Thompson. I think I do actually know her. I just did not know that she was a master's in method oh. practitioner. She moved out. She and her husband retired down there from uh, Wisconsin yeah, uh, two I, years ago. I might have actually ridden in a car with her to Rolex one year. But she is who I'm thinking of. I know that name for sure. Um, I will have to uh, have to look. But well, I can send you her her contact information if you want. Yeah, please do. Or, you know, however, I can look it up too. Um, yeah, or you can go on the website and just go to the courses calendar and scroll down, and you'll see hers. Okay, sweet. Um, all right. So let's see. I've got some more listener questions here. Okay. So for the people that do use chiropractors, is this something that you think would, you know, if it's done well and regularly would kind of negate the need for that or, um, well, you know, it depends on what's going on with your horse. So, um, it definitely goes along with chiropractic really well. A lot of chiropractors like to have the horse worked on before, or after because or between visits because that they find less going on when they come to visit and it lasts the, it holds longer when they make an adjustment and make, if chiropractor, or chiropractor makes an adjustment right and you get body this type of body work done because we focus on the whole horse and it's more like releasing tension you know with the nervous system from the inside then whatever they've adjusted holds better but you know it depends on what's going on with the horse and a lot of a lot of cases that they may not need the adjustment anymore yeah um but it just depends on the horse. Right. Of and, course. And you go with what works, you know, you go with what works for you. Right. Isn't that my advice the, on that? The catchphrase with horses. It depends on the horse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so does acupress- acupressure factor into your work at all in that same vein? Um, it uh, you know, if you know if you know acupressure ac- acupuncture, acupressure, I don't, I don't I never studied, you know, Chinese okay. medicine. I just started with that bladder meridian because those massage therapists that worked on our horses, they started with that bladder meridian. So I found that it's, it's a, it's a very easy line to follow. Um, all the other meridians are associated with it. It's kind of one of the major meridians. Um, it's easy to reach. Uh, but if you do, if you do know what, uh, traditional Chinese medicine and you know what points or what you can add that into the mix, you're getting feedback from the horse. Like a lot of times people come and take the course and, and they'll get a response somewhere and they'll say, oh, that's BL25. <laughs> you know, and they're, oh, oh yeah. okay, well, the horse is telling you BL25 is a good place to stop, you know. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I guess you don't have to technically know everything if it's working, working, you know. That no, but if you do know, if you do have that knowledge, you might, and you start to see patterns in the body of where they're responding to at different points, you might think, oh, well, this might, this might uh, mean something. This might point to something that's going on because, you know, there, it's one thing is releasing all the tension in the horse that you can, but the next part is, is helping the owner find out what's causing it. Because if you don't find out what's causing what's going on in the body, it's going to come back. So it right. can be lots of things. It can be feet, could be dental issues, could be saddle, could be the riding style. It could be a past in, uh, injury or accident. Um, sometimes that you don't even know about, but then you're doing body work on the horse and, and, um, and you, you know, you'll think, you know, this just feels like something's happened here and you'll ask the owner, is anything happened? And I'll say, Oh yeah, I remember my horse, um, uh, ran into something or right. they might not know what happened. Yeah. That makes perfect but, sense. But anyways, I, where I was going with this is that you know, the tension patterns in the body will often point to possible what I call primary issues. You know, like if, if a, the feet or front feet are sore, uh, they'll get sore tight in the pole and atlas on the same side as the sore foot. And they'll get sore in the diagonal behind. And then they'll get sore in a place we call the hoof point. So, you know, a lot of things create tension in the pole. But if you have three things that point to a possible foot issue, then then you might want to look into that. So when we, in our certification course with our certified practitioners, we start to learn to identify what, what the tension patterns are and what might be causing what you're finding in the body. And it's always, you know, it's a guess. It could be 
lots of things. But the more information you can gather while you're working on the horse, then the more you're able to help the owner find what might be causing it. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, I think, I think that pretty much goes for everything, you know, every yeah, facet right. of horses. Um, so I guess, um, we're getting a little long here on the episode, so I'm going to try and, um, cause I think you've pretty much covered most of the questions I have as far as like how people learn this. You said you have seminars and courses, books, DVDs, yeah. YouTube videos. YouTube online. videos the, I mean, a lot of people go and they, I want people to go try it, you know, mm-hmm. and, and try it. So we put stuff on the YouTube video on YouTube, a lot of stuff and they go out and try it. And if they get results and they like it, then they can come and learn more. Right. So, you know, I, you, you know, I don't want people to spend money on something that they may not, it might not be their thing. So, yeah, right. And I actually relate to you a lot in that way for, it might not be the best, bestest business model in the world, but I'm like, I want people to, to know about this and get into it. So I'm, giving away all of this information because yeah. I remember when I started reading your book and I saw all the videos on YouTube I was like he's insane why is he just giving all of this away I mean most people are like absolutely not yeah there's a paywall that's the old way of thinking yes so the more they the more they they learn then the more they want to learn and there's so much more to this I mean it's almost you you never stop getting better at doing body work yeah with this type of body work you never stop improving because I don't, I don't know why you just don't. Well, and I'm here to tell you, I am a certification chaser and a half. So, um, Uh there's a strong possibility that I will be Uh doing this at some point. I'm working on some saddle fit ones at the moment. So I'm, I'm trying to pace myself, but (laughs) yeah, pace yourself. Yes. I've got, got time to learn them all, but my, my brain tells me that I need to be a behaviorist, a saddle fitter and a body worker and a hoof care practitioner all at once. And oh, okay. I'm also getting my master's. <laughs> so I'm like, maybe, well, maybe not. <laughs> keep, keep that chiropractor's number handy. <laughs> yes, for sure. He is so, for you. <laughs> so, so constantly frustrated with me. Yes. <laughs> um, okay. So for the riders and trainers who are short on time, what, what would you recommend that they focus on or start with to be the most effective? I'm Gonna... Well, but you know, you go and watch the YouTube videos. But the Beyond Horse Massage book is—it's like the starting point. You mm-hmm. know, there's a there's it teaches you techniques you can do a head to tail, you know, work on your horse. Um, you you, can, you know you you gotta not you have to realize that you have to kind of learn how to develop the feel, and sometimes you get frustrated depending on you know how much your horse has going on. But um, the Beyond Horse Massage book and the DVD are the best place to start, and then the next is to do a weekend seminar. Yeah. Um, with someone yeah i as we've been talking i actually did look up Lori thompson and uh she's not the Lori thompson i was thinking of um because i got confused with somebody else and realized that the Lori thompson i'm thinking of actually used to own my horse um oh, okay. <laughs> and i don't i just got lost in the names but no i don't know her and i'm gonna have to send her an email but um yeah. I'm definitely. We have a we have a video called Light to the Core, and it's all really light techniques because oh, okay. you know Beyond Horse Massage involves you know picking up legs and doing mm-hmm. leg releases and and doing you know moving the head and neck around and I mean it, if you follow the steps in the book you can learn how to do it, um, but the Light to the Core is pretty cool because there's no you're not putting any pressure on the horse and you can get amazing releases and um, signs from the horse of what's going on in its body by doing doing that too right i mean you know I, again i don't want to do commercials but go for the, it some some people they are really you know they're not comfortable maybe picking up yeah a horse's legs and, and moving them around with a horse they don't know well so there's there's other options i i mean uh, my my people want resources and where to find them so uh you feel free to tell them exactly where to um, okay but yeah i was gonna ask too with um the light to the core which by the way funny very good pun i like it um (laughs) instead of right to the core light to the i I get it it's fun um so do you think that that would work better with an anxious or distracted horse um yeah there was a, a listener question that said um you know to help them stand and focus on you and the work. You know, I've tried the bladder meridian with my mare, but she gets bored or distracted before we get to release any tension. So mm-hmm. I feel like there's a couple things that could be happening. Of course, it's always hard to know without being able to see it. Um, but what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think that's that's why, 
you know, it's hard to work, uh, do this one uh, with a horse at Liberty because when you find something that's uncomfortable that they've been blocking out, then they want to, they want to leave. So, Mm -hmm. um, and they'll look for distractions and they'll look for distractions. So you kind of have to take away the distractions. And so that they'll, they'll, and it only takes, you know, a minute, maybe two minutes for a release to happen. And it's take, you know, different for different horses, but if you can just keep them with you, you know, long enough to get a good release, then they're going to say, start to feel, Oh, well, that wasn't so bad. I feel mm-hmm. better now. And they're, you know, it'll, some endorphins will kick in and they'll drop their head and then it's easier to work with them. But you know, you, if you have a horse that's really distracted or nervous, you just have to, I mean, you have to stay calm yourself and not react, but you got to keep them. I call it, you got to keep them in the neighborhood. Mm-hmm. So in order to get them to release the tension. And then usually it, it, it things, it goes downhill from there in a good way. Yeah. You know, I mean, things start to roll. Yeah. I think, um, one of my favorite things that I heard on Warwick's podcast, he just is getting all the promo in this episode. Um, <laughs> he, uh, he deserves it. <laughs> yes, he does. He, um, mentioned, you know, like the, I think it's a Chinese proverb that went, well, I'm going to butcher it, but when your attention okay. is to the future, you're anxious when it's to the past, you're depressed. And when it's in the present, that's when you find peace. And he was, he related that to the position of a horse's ears, like where their literal attention is. If it's out beyond them and they're attentive, they're anxious. And, um, I don't know how much the backwards applies to, you know, depression per se, but when, Uh when they're focused in the present, they're relaxed and getting them to come back to the present, um, you know, whatever like I work with my mare and I do this a little bit um you know she historically has always been very difficult to lead and um like I'm talking trotting sideways in front of you difficult to lead oh yeah Yeah, like coming off cross country everybody hated her (laughs) Uh and I I had to walk like the mile back to the barn beside her with her doing that um Uh and so when I when I learned that from Warwick it was like okay, maybe if I can just get her, you know, every like five steps to just kind of check in with me and I don't have to do anything other than like make a noise, you know, and then her Mm -hmm. ear flicks to me, then she's not concentrating on something in front of her or the getting back to the barn and like, go, I gotta go. So then she settles. And I think that that would also apply in this situation, working with an anxious horse when they're like off in space, looking at something out way in front of them and like, oh, I might need to move or leave, but if you could you know, somehow get well, yeah. their attention. Well, sometimes that happens when I'm doing it, you know, doing something on the horse. And uh, if I'm asking for movement, it's easier because mm-hmm. I can ask and soften right away. So right. I can ask and then soften. So they get that when I soften and they, they start to relax into it. But but if they're, I'm doing something light and they're they're distracting themselves by looking at something way off in the distance, I'll click or something. Mm-hmm. I just, you know, yeah. I'll do a little clicker with my mouth, you know, <laughs> just to get their attention back with me. Yeah. Because they're trying to they're trying to avoid feeling what's going on. <laughs> yeah. And I th- I think where would you start with a horse that is quite anxious? Like if like obviously it would be great to start in a stall or a small pen or um, you know, if you have a halter and lead and you can have an area where you have a handle on the situation, but also like where would you start on them physically? Well, well, you know, the, the bladder meridian starts up at the pole. Well, mm-hmm. it starts over the eye, but you can start up at the pole. But if they're too anxious up at the pole, then you can just start farther down the neck and towards the withers. You can start anywhere you want. Yeah. And then you could come back up again to the pole if you want. But you start where it's easiest for the horse. So okay. with the bladder meridian. And now they're anxious and they're young and now, you know, they're kind of walking around in circles and kind of squealing out at whoever's mm-hmm. out there. You just have to... St- you just have to walk in circles with them and keep your hand there. You know, if they step away and your hand comes away, then they just learn that that works. So there is a little bit, you've got to keep them in the neighborhood with you. So you just you let them walk in circles or not just ask them not to walk in circles um, and keep your hand there until they start to, I mean, it's a process, you know, it mm-hmm. might be they'll start to drop their head and look at you and then their head comes back up again. And so you just got to stay there with them until they finally, yeah. usually when that's happening, it's because something big is coming out. They, I call it, it's a fidget. When they fidget, it's because something big is loosening up. Okay. Uh, and, yeah. and also I found that, and this doesn't go with working at Liberty, but when you're holding a horse and it's walking in circles and you think you're in control, you're not. He's just walking you in circles. Right. But as soon as you loop the lead rope around something, like I'll loop it through the bar and hold the other end, so I, I, I you can let it in and out, the horse thinks it's tied and it'll stop. Because yeah. Because, it, 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 you know, it knows that it can't go anywhere, or it thinks it can't go anywhere. Mm-hmm. And you can let the slack in and out as you need it. But 
you know, so you do have to keep the horse in the neighborhood. Some horses that just don't want to, they don't want to deal with it. But, you know, I look at it, it's my job to, to help you get this out, you know? Right. Well, and I mean, and, it's... And, and you, you can't do it on your own, you know? Right. And this is You're one of those circumstances that is like, it's not a training. We're doing it because we want to have fun and go jump pretty colorful sticks. It's not for some you know, human desire, it's genuinely to help the horse. So that's where we use a protocol called Lima to evaluate, like, it's called least intrusive, minimally aversive. Um, Uh And, you know, in order to help the animal, you might have to escalate up the high or humane hierarchy. And so you might have to, like you say, you know, use negative reinforcement or tie them to something. Um, even well, if it's I, just yeah, yeah, I don't like to tie them, but I like to loop right. it around so I have the other end so that if they pull back, I can just yield. Right. And, and especially yeah. if you don't know the horse, but you well, know, you want to tie it. If you have to tie it, you want to tie it to something like bailing twine that'll break or something. But, but I, yeah, I get your point though. You have, you have to get up, you got to get the horse's attention, you know, you got to mm-hmm. get up to their level and then get them down. They'll right. follow you down, hopefully. And, and help them to feel better. And so, I mean, cause I know on my podcast, I talk a lot about, um, ethical training and things like that, but this is one of those circumstances where it's kind of like, you know, obviously what you do is so soft and kind and gentle, but I know that some people that listen to my podcast are like, you would, you would force a horse into a situation and for the sake of helping the horse feel better and be, you know, have a longer life and, last longer and not just like break down and end up arthritic it, yeah, and it's tight not and programmed to let tension go horses will hold on to stuff for years because right. they're not they're programmed to just block it out they don't really have any other option in the wild it's not like they can say oh we're going to go to the chiropractor i'm sore here right. they have to block it out because they're they're a target otherwise so they're not programmed to let it go and, right and you you've got it you're the i look at this my job to to help you let this go and right. then after you they've released some of that tension like life is so much better you know mm-hmm. and um anyways so yeah. it isn't it isn't training at all it's, i i agree and i think yeah. i i'm just covering our bases here <laughs> yeah. advocating yeah, that i, I do agree with you and i think that yes it is warranted sometimes to force a horse into a situation if it is genuinely going to be to their benefit and to help them and you know i imagine it's kind of like you know an uphill battle at first with some horses. And then after that, if you just power through those first couple of sessions, they're like, Oh, this rocks. We're doing this yeah. every day. Lady, come over here. Work on yeah. me. Um, well, it kind of brings up another thing. You know, a lot of people think that they've got to show the horse who's the boss. And, the, and uh-uh. that's not what the horse is looking for. The horse is looking for security and safety. Exactly. And confidence. They're looking for who's the confident one. So, so, You've got to be the confident ones. There, you don't have to smack them. You don't want to smack them because when you're you, you think you're showing them you're the boss. You're really showing them that you're insecure. And right. when I have a horse that's really difficult and unruly, I've learned that, that he's insecure. He's not trying to be the boss. Exactly. When horses that barge over you, they're not trying to be the boss. They're, they're somebody's got to be in charge of security, and if you're not, they are. Ugh. So you just have to be the confident one. I love that. And yeah, and that's what they want. So sometimes it takes a couple. They have to circle around you a few times, and you, I would just hand the lead rope around me and mm-hmm. let them go in circles. And then pretty soon, 99% of the time, they start to realize, well, this person isn't trying to show me who's the boss. This person is really comfortable or, right. and confident. I'm going to kind of stick around with this person. Exactly. And I do demos at expos, and I'll have a horse that's just going around in circles, and, I, and I'll just let him go in circles and hand the lead rope around while I'm talking to the whoever's mm-hmm. at the demo. And I ignore the horse and just let him go around, and pretty soon – the horse stops going around in circles and we start doing some, the demonstration. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I, I mean, I think, I mean, how could you blame the horse for being like that if they've only ever dealt with people that are trying to assert their dominance and authority over them? So, I mean, it, yeah. it makes perfect it, sense. They, they kind of get confused sometimes. Like, Hey, wait a minute. How come you're not, you're not trying to, how come you're not making me, how come you're not, you're, you're uh, jerking on my head rope and making me stand still? How come you're not, yeah. you know, yelling at me? How come you're ignoring me? <laughs> you yeah, know? and then you're... And, and then pretty soon they, they realize, oh, it's it's much easier just for me to just stand here and, and or working on a horse with somebody, a uh, owner's horse, and I'll I'll hold the horse. I'll say, I'll just take the lead rope so he can get used, used to me. And then I listen to the owner explain what's going on with the horse. And then during that process, the horse starts to drop its head and starts yawning mm-hmm. because... There's no pressure on the horse. Like you're, you're not even looking at the horse. You're looking at the owner. 
So, right. and, and you're just there, there to be <clears throat> the confident one, you know, and, and they really respond to that. That's what they want. Yeah. And I think, I think that that realization has made the biggest difference for me. And I know it has for countless others, Warwick included. I mean, he talks about his journey with that. And once I started listening to that and actually paying attention to it, and there are so many other trainers too, but just paying attention to your own state and like, mm-hmm. what are you asking of the horse, even if you're not literally cueing them or commanding them to do anything in the moment? Are you asking mm-hmm. anything of them with your body language or with your energy and just to let it all go and relax? It's so it's so cool to see when you can get to that place, when you go grab a horse that might be a little bit anxious in a situation and they mm-hmm. just take a big sigh when they're near you. It's like the biggest compliment ever. It's like they yeah. this herd animal that is a prey animal and historically very scared and depends on companionship in order to survive is comfortable and feel safe with me. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. And especially yeah, and when you make a, them feel it's better. It's a process too, you know, the horse mm-hmm. won't just look at you and then lay down, you know, it's a process. They've got to kind of, you just got to be patient with them and give them a chance to respond to, to who you are. And then yeah. gradually they come down. Yeah. Um, okay. So I think we're getting a little bit close to the end of, um, probably both of our (laughs) bandwidths here. Um, So I just have a couple more questions from listeners. Uh, One concerning um, a horse that has a condition PSSM1, and also there is PSSM2. So generally for horses that have those muscular issues, is there anything that you would do? I assume this would be like great for them. Um, Well, yeah, I have a a mare that's insulin resistant and she had laminitis for a year. I mean, and... uh, they just are they're they're muscle sore either yeah. from but she was muscle sore from sore feet but she was muscle sore just from having that condition mm-hmm. and so the light you know the light work is really helpful because you're not putting any pressure on the horse you're yeah. getting their nervous system let go and a lot of times when they let go they let, it releases endorphins into their system which is like a natural painkiller um the scapula release techniques that i do it's just getting the sh- sh- scapula to relax and drop mm-hmm. um for some reason, that that technique often releases a lot of endorphins into the horse's system, and they'll drop their head down. So it's just anything you can do to get them to relax their muscles, and it's going to help. Yeah. Um, so a horse who carries tension, worry, or stress in his neck. I'm assuming, obviously, there's bladder meridian and um, your movement techniques that you were talking about. Is there anything else? Yeah, the, well, the lateral cervical flexion technique, and there's a head a technique I call head up. I didn't get very creative with the names, you know. So, um, but the head up technique in the Beyond Horse Massage book, you know, explains how to do it. But there's another way to do it called the hands hands under the chin, yeah. and there might be on a YouTube video. I'm not sure. I think but I've seen it's you just do giving it. Giving the horse an opportunity yeah. to relax its its head onto something because they don't they never relax their their pole, mm-hmm. you know, unless they're laying down. But if you just gently lift, like sometimes it always all it take all it takes is one pound of pressure. You lift on their chin really slowly till the eye blinks, and you just wait there, and they'll start to relax uh, the pole. Sometimes it's a process. If they're really tense, it's going to be a process of getting a little one, a little one, a little one, and then gradually you get a little lateral flexion, and then get another head up. So um, those so are true. techniques that help release tension in the. Oh, another very simple one, and it's. I don't know where it's, it's called the thumb release or, or tongue release. You rest your thumb on the roof of their mouth or under the tongue and you get their tongue moving. They'll work their own tongue, releases tension in the hyoid, which mm-hmm. is bone, which is way up between under the mandibles. And that releases tension in the pole. And that thing so, is so important for some reason. I've read so many things about horses having hyoid issues and mm-hmm. yeah, that, that is definitely one that I think. Probably. And you can do that every day with your horse. You have to make sure if you're resting the thumb on the roof of the mouth that you don't let them drag their thumb up in your thumb up into their molars mm-hmm. because that really hurts their ears when that happens. Oh, um, really? Yeah, when you scream. Right oh, there. okay. Well, but, uh, you made me walk right into that one, and now I'm very <laughs> upset. <laughs> but you um. can rest your finger under the tongue on the bar. Just keep your mm-hmm. finger soft, and just the goal is just to get the horse working his tongue, and he'll start to work his tongue in and out and in and out. And it'll loosen up the hyoid. Mm-hmm. So um, there is one more thing. You know, we started a membership program at the beginning of this year. Mm-hmm. And there's two levels. One level is for people that have done the weekend. But the other level is for 
anybody that just wants to watch every month, I'll, I'll videotape a session on a horse and then we'll replay the video and I'll answer questions on it. Okay. And it's only, I think, ten ninety five a month or something. That's awesome. Uh, and so, you know, every month I work on a horse with different issues and answer questions. So, yeah. and uh, I probably do those techniques on every horse. Yeah. Um, so the horse, horse with the tension in the neck and the pole, you know, you might get some good tips from from watching that. So that's on our website too. Yeah. And I mean, the other questions are pretty much to the effect of like, in a horse, in a variety of work, you know, a pasture pet to five to six days a week of work. Um, mm -hmm. Is there a difference or how often to get body work? And I'm assuming that your answer is probably like, do it as much <laughs> as you can the all the time. <laughs> that and do it as much as you can all the time. <laughs> well, it, 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 um, it kind of depends what's going on with the horse. So horse, okay. you can have a horse that's super fit and doesn't have, you know, issues like foot issues or any past, you know, issues. <clears throat> it's being, being ridden well and it's working five or six days a week. And it may not, and it, and it may need, I don't know, say once a month if you just want to keep it, you keep it loose. Or you might have a horse that doesn't work five days a week but has serious issues, you know, is has sore feet, has dental issues, has a history of, you know, um, or has had a bad saddle for a long time that might need more body work than the horse that's working regularly. But you, you don't want to do a full session on a horse uh, more than once a week because it, their nervous system it, it needs time to process okay. the releases. So Interesting. you can, you can cook the horse too much if you okay. work on it too long or too, too frequently. So yeah. you can do a little bit every day, 15 minutes every day, but you don't want to do an hour and a half every day on your horse. You yeah. want to give it at least a week in, be in between. So ideally, you know, once a month, it would be a great maintenance okay. um, thing Sweet. for a horse in general. Yeah. I was just sitting here thinking that it's, it kind of works I would assume that this method works similarly to how kinesiology tape works and that, you know, it's a blood flow thing, uh, brings your nervous system's attention to it. Uh -huh, and if yeah. you were to tape your entire body, you're probably not going to feel super great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Especially if you left it on for a long time. Yeah. Um, so the nervous system has to have time, time to process okay. releases in the horse. Okay, cool. Well, then yeah. I'm glad I asked that question because I was like, it seems like the answer would be to no much is, or no much yeah. is too much. Yep. <laughs> so this yeah. is a less is more thing. Okay, sweet. Oh, well, that I think that will make a lot of people quite happy. Um, so, if somebody did want to get certified um, in being a practitioner, all of those instructions are on your website. Or is there anything you want to say about that? Yeah, it's a pretty extensive course. You know, you start with a weekend seminar, and then if you want to learn more, you do a five-day advanced course. And okay. then if you want to go on to certification, we have a fieldwork program where you do. Uh, you do tons of cases of that ease and you write them up and you send them into a mentor and a mentor gives you feedback. You work with a coach, you know, three times through that process. So it takes about a year. Yeah. It's a pretty, ex it's a pretty, you know, uh, extensive course. Cause I want people to come out the other end, you know, really good at it. So, right. Um, and that's the goal to get really good at the techniques. Right. Um, quality over quantity explained on the website too. Okay. Yeah. Well, is, I mean, I guess concluding thoughts, is there, Something that you're like really excited about coming up, or something that you did, like a big goal accomplished, or something, you know. Well, you did way. mention, you know, getting kids started learning about not just getting on and going. And mm -hmm. recently, we had two people certified that are pony club trainers out in California, and so oh, awesome. we're gonna um, we're going to the pony club uh, finals in Lexington at the end of July, huh. and they're bringing four of their students' kids, and they're we're gonna do demonstrations where their kids are gonna teach other pony club kids how to do the bladder awesome. routine and do some of the basic techniques. Yeah, so we'll I definitely... be at Lexington for two days doing demonstrations with uh, pony clubbers and, and we're writing up a, man, a, a master's and method manual for pony club. That's awesome. Kids. Yeah. That's a hundred percent something that should be in pony club. I mean, they teach you everything else about horse care. Why not that? <laughs> well, it's, it's doing that. They, they're excited because they said it's been, they're doing a lot with their pony club kids and that it does a couple things. Once it really makes them aware of their, of what's going on with their horse mm -hmm. as far as where it might be sore, you know, the horse is releasing tons and it's left, left lower back. Yeah. Oh, well maybe that's why it's, you know, bucking or kicking or something. And, and then it, it also just connects them with the horse. It's the horse is no longer something you just get on and go. It's something that you actually can inter have an inter interaction and a relationship with on a different level. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. 
and uh, I think I think that's absolutely wonderful. So that's super. I mean, I think that that's definitely something that should be wider, yeah, <laughs> a wider understanding for everyone. I am like losing my words a hundred percent. This is I've reached the end of my <laughs> bandwidth. I don't know if you can tell. Sometimes I can podcast for three hours. I literally have episodes where I've sat for three hours and podcasted, <laughs> and it's not happening today. But um, well, your nervous system's processing probably. It is. probably <laughs> is. Um, <laughs> I'm having releases over the phone. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. So, I mean, is there anything that you want to plug or talk about here at the end before we wrap no, up? No, just go to the website if you want to learn more and then watch some of the YouTube videos and just go out and try it. Okay. Try, try the, try the Flight of Meridian or whatever you're comfortable doing that's on, on our YouTube videos. Yes. You know, I just encourage people to do it. You can't hurt the horse. Um, if you're doing it anywhere near the way it's, uh, you know, it's explained, you can't hurt the horse with this. Yeah, that's awesome. And I mean, I am, I have the book sitting next to me on my desk and I have been fidgeting in my seat this entire time wanting to go touch my horse and give this a go. (laughs) Good. So uh, I will let you go. Thank you so much for coming on and, you know, talking to me and giving the listeners some more information about this. I think it's, it's going to be really awesome for everyone to hear. Yeah, well, you're welcome. I was happy to do it. Awesome. It's been fun. Thank you. All right. All right. And, and get hold of Lori Thompson. I absolutely will. Don't, okay, don't you worry about it. <laughs> All right. Thanks. All right. Thanks. Okay. It's over. Did you guys enjoy that? I hope that you did. Uh, my okay was probably a little loud there. Apologies. Um, I hope that you also enjoyed me stumbling, trying to figure out how to end it. Um, because I always do this fun thing where I forget to tell my guests beforehand that um, I'm not hanging up on them when I say goodbye and that we're just ending. So then in my head, I'm like, oh my God, how do I, I don't know how to say this without screwing up the recording and I don't want to stop it and I have to restart it. And then, so um, yeah, that was me not thinking or me not speaking while I was thinking and then just whatever was falling out of my face was falling out of my face. So I hope it wasn't too awkward to listen to there at the end. <clears throat> anyway. Um, It is multiple hours after I've recorded this interview because I had some stuff I had to do. Um, But, oh my God, how cool. How cool. I have been just on a high all day from doing this episode. I absolutely loved talking to Jim, you know, on and off the podcast. He is such an amazing person, so kind. And I just, oh, I love what he does. It's like how, sorry, I have stuff in my throat. But like how perfect could a modality of body work be for clicker trainers and positive reinforcement people? Like, I feel like I'm just a big fat ad today, but um, like I just, it seems like it would go so well with what, you know, I do and what we talk about on this podcast. Um, So I'm really interested to hear what you guys think. Um, You know, don't be afraid to start a conversation in the comments on the Instagram or the Facebook posts. Um, you know, you can find it at Equitheory, uh, any, anywhere like that, or you can comment on the YouTube video version, um, or you can talk about it on the Discord server if you're a patron. But yeah, I just, I am so happy that this episode went the way that it did. And, um, you know, Jim and I were talking about it afterwards and he said something that I thought should probably be in the podcast. So he was talking about, you know, for those of us that have anxious beans <laughs> that tend to be a little bit more high energy to start on a horse that is lower energy. So you kind of, you know, can work on your feel and get get better at it before you go to, you know, a horse that might be a little bit more difficult or might be more um, guarded, so to speak. So, you know, practicing on a horse that's more calm and chill and willing to let go, then you can like you know, see what your, your actions, how they're affecting the horse. And then you can go to other horses and apply them a little bit more easily. So hope that's helpful. I can't wait to hear what you guys have to say. If you try this, you know, film it, tag me in it and post it, um, at Equitheory or Jet Equitheory, whatever, you know, um, and cause I want to see what you guys do. I want to see you guys give it a try and see what happens with your horses. Um, And as always, please feel free to share this episode with your friends or 
um, on your social medias. I will do my best to also share them, but sometimes I forget to check the Equitheory podcast. So, you know, if you do share something to your story, just go ahead and tag both of my accounts and then I'll be like, oh, okay. Because for some reason I tend to get the Jet Equitheory notifications more so than the Equitheory ones. Um, but yeah, so I cannot wait to see what you guys think about this. I'm very excited and I hope that you guys like it. This was a big interview for me. Um, and Jim, if you're listening, thank you endlessly for being on. Um, first person that I've talked to that I haven't known on my podcast. So very, very cool. And I can't, I just, ah, uh, I want to do more and, you know, have more people like him on. And, uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm rambling at this point. I just, I'm, I'm so happy with this episode. I hope that you guys love it and share it and, you know, give it a shot. Hope it helps your horses. That's the point of all of this, isn't it? Um, with that said, I guess I will catch you guys next week. Thanks so much for listening. Have a good one.